So, with great pleasure, I introduce George Kenaway, a uh, highly accomplished cellist in all sorts of worlds, including his local performance, researcher from the University of Huddersfield, to talk to us. Thank, thank you very much. Text. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm aware of my position in this, in the timetable of this afternoon. Uh, uh, I'm enormously privileged to be called uh, Tom Cortman's warm up act. It's a career climax for me. Uh, and thank you very much for accepting this paper. I'm revisiting a topic that I first published a book chapter on about seven years ago. Uh, I thought that was sketchy then, and I'm afraid this is sketchy now, but I hope there's something of interest to it most people can. And I'll be speaking largely from the point of view of 19th century music, so we're going very quickly forward. Uh, there are two, and some of the statements I make here are not intended as statements of fact, they are opinion, and you will be able to tell the difference. Um, there are, broadly speaking, two basic approaches to musical texts, and I'm talking about scores, notes on the page here. Uh, what I call the Protestant version and the Roman Catholic version, and I do not mean to cause any religious offence at all. <laughs> I just want to use that as shorthand. The Protestant approach needs only one text. This, this is the Ur text. This is already problematic, as there are competing Ur texts in the market. Um, and I thought this would be a good place to start. Uh, this is the famous Scottish children's cartoon that every Scottish person grew up with many years ago called Urwally. And the slogan is Urwally, Urwally, Abigiswally. Uh, I've done that in Dutch as well as English. <laughs> 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 and notice that in this picture, uh, Urwali has actually drawn himself on a fence in front of him. He's standing behind the fence, his real feet are pointing through the hole at the bottom of the fence, and that's his real face at the top. I think that's a very complex image, actually. <laughs> Uh, it sort of stands for the status of the composer versus the piece of music in front of him. Uh, but I'll just leave that uh, on the floor for you just now. There are problems with the Ur text. Uh, there are several competing Ur texts. Different people generate different Ur texts. It's as if God created several different versions of the Ten Commandments, and we have to work out what he really intended. In 1914, the Latin scholar Albert Clark argued that omission in the transmission of biblical texts was a more common scribal error than addition, saying that, I quote, a text is like a traveller who goes from one inn to another, losing an article of luggage at each halt. <laughs> Musical texts in my field work in exactly the opposite way. Uh, they, as time goes on, they accumulate more and more baggage until it's all thrown away with the Ur text. But this luggage is part of the text's history in our culture. The text, in other words, is the hero of a picaresque novel who gradually learns about himself through travel and adventures. It acquires information. Here's a simple example from Bach, one of his most well-known pieces for the cello. Uh, I've just picked a few of these, but you can see that the text gets increasingly complicated from the first printed edition of 1824 through Grootsmarker's wonderful edition for concert performance, which came, I know, extremely well, for concert performance because you couldn't possibly play what Bach wrote. Okay. I've just put a few red lines, but there are millions of different. Uh, Pollan's edition from 1918, which I hadn't looked at until I put this paper together, uh, equally densely uh, annotated, although less obviously than Groot's mark, but there's a lot going on there. And Alexanian's uh, extraordinary analytical edition of Bach, which only tries to show you how the phrases are constructed. There are no dynamics. Partly, of course, because Bach wrote almost none. But uh, nonetheless, he's more concerned to analyse the music than you can't play from this. I mean, I, I can't play from this. But then, of course, we throw all that away. And we come back to little information again. This is the Baron Writer or text, um, Woodville Harris. That gives us a little history of the different sources and things, but it's as plain as plain could be. 
And that is the process which I've, uh, you can see happening, uh, happening a great deal. With historical research in the 19th century, these older musical texts are surrounded by other texts. Uh, these could be verbal texts, treatises, newspaper articles, reviews, all sorts of things like that. Old audio recordings, old film, uh, a novel with relevant content, uh, photographs, contemporaneous annotated editions from the period of the piece itself and from later periods. Using these resources can illuminate the performance of the musical text in question. But that is not the whole story. That's because what musicians actually like is not so much detailed historical documentation. Of course, they do like that, but it's not everything. What they like is something they can weave a story that informs or inspires their performance. This could be a fantasy, for instance, that Schubert's last year was a death-obsessed traversal of everything gloomy in human existence. It wasn't. It could be a mental picture of Bach's caffeine-fueled uh, caffeine Leipzig copy, copy house, which might explain the performance I heard of Brandenburg IV recently, which was taken at unbelievable breakneck speed. It seems like they've been on espresso all day. <laughs> <laughs> when Gasalov exclaimed of a passage in the Schumann Cello Concerto, uh, talking about the concerto trying to inspire a student, he talked about pain, all this pain, the poor man. <laughs> it's hokum, because when Schumann composed the Cello Concerto, he was relatively sane. <laughs> it was the proofreading that killed him. <laughs> That's actually true. Uh, uh, but uh, Casals tells a story about the mentally ill Schumann, which inspires the student and generates the performance. Um, the story can be true, in other words, but it need not be. And it's for the performer's benefit, so the audience doesn't need to know anything about what is in their mind. The Protestant approach needs no intermediary to gloss the musical text for the performer. That seems simple, but there are two problems. Firstly, in spite of a scientific method, your <laughs> texts can differ markedly for a whole host of reasons. New sources, different interpretations of a mark on the page, that kind of thing. Heightened counter trios are a happy hunting ground for people who want to check the differences between your texts. Uh, and there's obviously a risk that the text itself comes from a time when performance conventions were taken for granted and not written down. A newer text of an 18th or 19th century work that does not take this into account will encourage some music musicians to play Call Me Scripto and not read between the notes. Reading between the notes is what we do now in 19th century music, as a way, for those of you who are um, Reading between the notes. The editor, Jonathan Del Mar, neatly sidesteps this question by prevent, presenting a view of Urtex creation that limits the editor's aim to reconstructing the composer's notational intention. Not the performing intention, not the expectation, which one of my colleagues always uses, the expectation of what the sound was, no, what he intended to write down. And that's, I can sign up to that philosophy, I like that. What the composer wanted to write, uh, that's available on Baron Reiter's website at the moment. And even what seem to be the composer's clear instructions can create problems. If the composer says that the work is to be played exactly as written, or that some particular technique is or is not to be used, it's an easy matter to undermine any of these commands, because practice and theory are always non-aligned. There are many examples of composers saying, play as written, but actually, what I heard you just do was great, so keep doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, Messiaen and Debussy both more or less did exactly the same thing. So did uh, Michael Tibbet. Britain, on the other hand, was obsessive about saying, just do what I wrote on the page. In fact, no one does what Britain wrote on the page. Uh, but I won't go into that just now. Perhaps we know of a performance given by the composer himself or herself at a different tempo with different phrasing. Or we know that he or she heard a very different performance that they still liked. Negative instructions are particularly bad. What does non vibrato mean? It can mean at least any of those things. Don't use vibrato here. I know you, I mean, 
uh, use vibrato all the time, but don't do it here. I know you play the sort of passage with vibrato, but not here. I don't care where you use vibrato, as long as it's not here. <laughs> it can mean all of these things. And if you want to see how this takes you into uncharted territory, the cello part of César Franck's String Quartet raises precisely this problem. Uh, only the cellist is told to play without vibrato. <laughs> And it wasn't the cellist that says a frog had in mind, either. His vibrato was unexceptional. Um, any statement of this kind, positive or negative, can be undermined. The general approach is to say the composer used words in a different sense from today's meaning. Or the command, don't do this, means that everyone did this. And so we can do it. Um, and I've seen examples. It's as if in the Ten Commandments meant that in practice, murder and theft were the norm in Moses Egypt. <laughs> this type of sophisticated commentary can be valid, but it can also just be a case of confirmatory bias arising from loyalty to an overall musical worldview. In no area more than vibrato is this clearer. Those who fundamentally dislike it as a matter of principle can amass all sorts of references and reviews that approve of some singers. Uh, silvery flute-like glassy tone. Those who think vibrato is essential will say this is vocally unhealthy or find other approving references to vibrato or get involved in tortuous distinctions between different terminologies in different languages. This perennial heated uh, discussion is fueled by the potential ambiguity of the texts. Of course, musicians and performers are entirely free to prefer, to prefer any sound quality they like and play or sing or buy tickets accordingly. The Catholic approach is more complicated. Oh, I've got five minutes? Yeah. Yeah, right. the, yeah. The Catholic approach is more complicated. It needs a lot of texts because there are a lot of prophets. <laughs> but carefully curated. Here, great players like Joachim, for instance, are like biblical commentators or prophets interpreting the text of the composer. The problem is there are a lot of prophets out there. Over roughly 100 years, there were at least 10 different editions of the Beethoven violin sonatas. In 1877 alone, there were three different editions of Mendelssohn's cello sonatas. Scholars now further interpret those player editors, discriminating between those who transmit the true message and other outliers who are just eccentric or perhaps dull. Some more recent Urtex editions also do this, while making wide reference to things like alternative cadenzas, explaining unnotated performance practices that can be shown to have been current at the time of composition. And here I will plug Kate Bennett's edition of the Brahms Cello Sonata, which is an object lesson of how to do this kind of thing. Oh, it's all right, she's already given me a bottle of wine. Um, uh, these editions, in other words, teach us how to read older texts, but some voices are not heard mainly the voices of amateur musicians or even novelists, some of whom found the austere performance of Alfredo Piatti or Josef Joachim or even Brahms cold. Who decides, in other words, what writings belong in the Apocrypha? In a further refinement of the Protestant approach, um, performers are now free to take any musical text as their starting point. Here's uh, an example of... Um, a passage from Haydn's uh, Sonata Number no. Four, First Movement. And this is Ferdinand David's fingering for a first violin passage in the first movement from 1867. Yeah. I've never heard anyone play that. I would love to hear someone play this. But let's look back a bit. Uh, here's the same passage. It occurs three times in the movement. Um, early editions both is or articulated differently in an apparently random way. There is no system to this at all. But please note how many times, if at all, the last note of the left-hand example is played with a separate bow. I just ask you that question. This takes us up to the 1830s. From then on, gradually we see that we're going to play the whole thing in one bow from about the middle of that diagram. There are earlier examples. And everyone is agreeing that it's all in one bow. They don't all give fingerings, 
and most of the time they give fingerings, it's much less exciting than Ferdinand Darby's one finger exercise. But now, Roman Jones's edition, which every serious quartet player uses, uh, gives an example which does not occur in any early text, not one. Uh, and these, last, these isolated notes at the end are entirely unique to this edition. It's in the spirit, I think, we could agree, it's in the spirit of the early editions, but it is not exactly following them. Uh, and this is a very nice example of how uh, a note text creates a text that no player at the time would have seen, uh, which does raise a little problem. Now, we can go further with Darby's fingering, because we could play that Haydn piece with 18th century instruments, using 18th century performance conventions, and his fingering. Why could we do this? Well, one answer is that there were several violinists in the late 18th century who used portamento in that way. Uh, the famous examples are Mestrino and Loli. Uh, did I do a slide for this? I can't remember. Oh, yeah, here we are. Uh, these are late 18th century examples of violinists doing portamento. Mm -hmm. So we can construct uh, this one on the right is a, a, a famous example of how to notate literally using enharmonic notes uh, the exact amount of portamento. Um, so we could say, look, what would happen if uh, Voldemar or Mastrino or Lully played this piece? Maybe they would have tried this fingering. Very well, that's a story we can go with. That's how we'll play it tonight. Um, we could even invent a story that Haydn was joking with one of his Esterhazy violinists about Portamento. And he demonstrated it as a joke. And he thought, actually, that's a rather good idea. Let's do it like that. Um, what our research, in other words, produces is not always facts. It's more like a historical novel. And this would be counterfactually informed. <laughs> which, frankly, it interests me much more these days. Um, there are many examples of later performances being used as guides to earlier practice. Uh, with early recordings, this is uh, part of the course. Uh, we use the recordings made up till the 1920s as guides to string playing that could, in theory, go back to the middle of the 19th century in some cases. Uh, how far you go back depends on the amount of missionary zeal that you are imbued with. But uh, it, it is arguable. The cellist Verbilovich, uh, recorded in 1902, was in his 50s at the time. He was probably playing a bit like his teacher Davidov taught, taught him in the 1860s. Uh, maybe, maybe not. In 1913, Nikish recorded Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, uh, and you can hear uh, examples of unnotated inégalité in the slow movement. Uh, quite, quite clearly, this is quite well known. And Mari Soldat Rogo's recording of the slow movement of Spohr's Ninth Concerto uh, seems to retain aspects of her own teacher's teaching, who was himself a pupil of Spohr. So, uh, one or two of my colleagues would like to find traces of Leopold Mozart in, um, in Mari Soldat Rogo. Uh, I do not, but that route is open to you if you want to take it. How far you go back is entirely up to you. And now the new historically informed performances are treated themselves as texts. In the 19th century, students were advised to listen to good players, to learn all the things that couldn't be taught by writing them down. Like go to concerts, listen to this guy, listen to that one. Um, uh, some things could not be taught, but definitely they could not be taught. You could only learn them by listening to good examples. How you find the good example you know, if you live in Scunthorpe in the north of England, I don't know if many good examples are available. But nonetheless, that's the idea. But nowadays, of course, everyone learns from records. Uh, 25 years ago, I was conducting in Russia an orchestra somewhere many kilometres east of Moscow. They wanted to play some Purcell. I was horrified, but I said, OK. I arranged some music, took it out there. They knew everything. The wind players embellished perfectly. They automatically used limited vibrato. They understood the dissonances. They understood everything. The violas were very happy to play for itself. They all are. Uh, and I said, how on earth do you know this? Uh, and they said, well, we have YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Uh, you learn styles by transmission in that way. So these performances become texts for study. 
In literary criticism, I won't go down this avenue too far, but in literary criticism, these disputes disappeared years ago. Uh, in the 1920s, there was a school of literary criticism called the New Ha, the New Criticism, where you focused only on the words on the page, cleaned up every biographical reference, every reference to the author's intention, only the words on the page, um, which was basically how I studied English literature when I was young. Um, eventually, of course, people realised that literary texts, paintings, pieces of music are porous structures. They are not a self-contained object like a glass ball or something that you couldn't put anything inside. Things go in and out of them in, in various ways. And now people are perfectly happy uh, in literature uh, to deal with these kind of objects. And the Ur text is, in some respects, very much a, a, a legacy of that kind of thinking that you can isolate the text, and that is the, the thing. It's not true of music, it's not true of the other things either. Texts cleaned from human traces, Tariskin said something quite provocative about that, um, are more like a machine. Uh, I.A. Richards, the literary critic in the 1920s, has famously said that the book is a machine to think with. I don't think we see it quite like that now. Um, I won't take you down the route of the American Constitution unless we have another five minutes. <laughs> I will just briefly summarise. Uh, my colleague uh, and friend, uh, Ian Gallico, is professor of law in Syracuse University, he wrote an article, he's a good musician, but he is a lawyer. Uh, he wrote an article about the American Constitution, which compared Justice Scalia's interpretation of the Constitution with how he might conduct the Eroica Symphony. Uh, Scalia is not a musician, but he takes a view of the American Constitution that it means basically what it meant then which means, in turn, that later ideas are not relevant. Now, this applies, for instance, to the notion of, forgive me, it's been a long day, the notion of cruel and unusual punishment. When the Constitution included that in one of the amendments in the 1790s, it was quoting an English law from a hundred years earlier. The cruel and unusual punishment was against the rights of man. But of course, what was thought cruel and unusual in 1680 and 1790 might seem pretty obviously cruel and unusual now, but it doesn't work the other way around. So, Scalia's reading would be that this excludes horrible medieval forms of execution, but it doesn't exclude anything like what might have happened, for instance, I'll just pick an example, I've got time in my bed. So, uh, these readings of the Constitution uh, parallel musicological discourse remarkably well. If I think I can undermine any text by saying, no, that's not what those words meant then, or alternatively, yeah, but you know, if Bach had had a Hammond organ, then he would have written differently, which I'm sure we've all heard, someday, then we're dealing with the same kind of problem. Uh, Musical scores, in other words, have gone the opposite way from biblical manuscripts. They've acquired more luggage and got rid of it. The Protestant approach has to deal with many musical texts. That leads to a provisional status for performance. That actually creates an ontological question about music. What is the piece? Um, uh, I would like to hear a pianist say, I've just played some Chopin, but next week I will play from his German edition. And that will make something more different. The Catholic approach needs lots of text and commentaries and texts, but also careful management to avoid heresy. Joachim says this about Brahms. Ignore the cellist Heinrich Grünfeld, who found his playing cold. We, musicians, are lucky. The judge you might be up against in the USA could very significantly affect, or indeed curtail, your life depending on how he reads the Bill of Rights. Um, on the other hand, uh, musicians are not quite in that situation. So in the end, as a feeble summing up, I recommend musical ecumenism. All are welcome. Thank you very much.
uh, two um, biblically informed approaches <laughs> <laughs> to dealing to dealing with uh, the mass of texts that we have to uh, have to try and, uh, and assimilate and uh, reconcile and take stock of in different ways. Yes, I will start. You know, uh, yeah, I've been thinking a lot of points of references for him that would help us represent the work today because uh, I remember not, not listening not so long ago to Gustav Leonhardt's uh, recording and he reads the whole text before playing. It's impossible to, to listen to. Um, but, but then if you, if you see how the, um, the lines are made up and, and, and the sonatas, the actions, it almost made me think of Commedia dell'arte, like in Zibel Gone, where they say you do this action now, and then what is actually done is uh, illocutio, maybe, or disposition, uh, or, or Valet de Cour, uh, where we see is, is like early Lully, and then they dance. So maybe pantomime could also, although at the risk of uh, turning everything into, into plain comedy, um, but at any rate, even in the action scenarios, what struck me is that even the, where he gives these sentences, there are also, a, a, again, effects. And then I had to think of early movie, where you get uh, like a, a, a little s a screen, this is what is happening, and then they act out the thing. So uh, I, I agree there's a lot of creativity to be, to be used on, on, on this. I don't know what you think of it. Who knows possible? Like we know he was a funny man. <laughs> His novel is funny. But one thing what uh, he mentions in the preface, he says uh, uh, quite clearly that I try to do that in the way that it, it is done in opera. So this is quite the preference um, uh, that he was thinking really in this very illustrative way. And it was a way to adopt maybe the the certain um, scenarios uh, in instrumental piece and the way that would be done maybe in opera or what you have mentioned for maybe the art etc it's a synthetic uh, synthetic uh, genre and um, he mentions that and he's quite aware that it's maybe uh, not so easy to um, to do that on the harpsichord, so that's why he needs all the text, explanations, etc., etc. But the way of thinking was pretty in the same way, what you are asking, but I think it's very logical questions what arise, and Kuno mentions that in the preface, so that was for him also quite obvious. So, um, I think for the normal people in, in Kuno's time, they knew all the stories. Yeah. So they didn't need all the information which we need now. We, we have got. But the other thing I thought while you were talking, the word students fantasticus didn't come up. And when you call at an Athanasius Kirche, which the, the first one speaks about students, I think those are the perfect examples of students fantasticus with all the contrast which is there. So maybe that's worth to, to look at, well at, uh, at those pieces as students fantasticus. And, uh, and I mean, some of the some of the elements were fantastic, and Kuno did really a very good job. Some of them are a little bit naive, but I think it's a unique uh, uh, complex of six sonatas. And, uh, yes, so lovely to hear them, to play them. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I do agree. That's a very extraordinary set of music. I think. Yes, actually, um, another idea that came up because I was recently working on an, on an Italian 18th century text which, by Contaricati, which talks literally about expression in music. And this comes up again, actually, this, the, the question, if the composer is already doing all the expression, namely all the things you can look at this imitation mm -hmm. of action, imitation of affect, because in uh, when the uh, esprit animo are moving slowly, we are rather sad, etc. Where, where is the where is the expression for the for the executor, the performer, uh, still located? In other words, where does the where, where does where does the translation act uh, need to come in? Well, it's a question rather difficult to answer because I'm not a performer. 
um, and musicologists and um, the analyzing the piece you know, from a scientific point of view, of course, I play and try to listen to, uh, listen to and um, so I don't know, that's maybe a question for someone who, um, who are in the performance situation and what are his or her experience and co um, contact with the, with the music itself. So I cannot really answer your question, but maybe just some thoughts for someone who is doing it. I would say as well that it's for the performer extremely important to exaggerate this music, otherwise it will not work. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you ask trumpets to play like we heard on the harpsichord, I think trumpets would be much more musical to do. <laughs> and, and they would go much more like this. <laughs> and uh, so I, I think the, the, the music works as well with creativity of the player. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so. Yes, I have the experience that um, even if um, we all know these concepts, um, many musicians don't. And if you really um, help them to be incredibly creative in um, imagining these affects, uh, so that you know fury and melancholy and, and all you know all the affects um, become become really um, palpable, palpable almost in their own body, uh, it makes a huge difference. Um, and I very often do that with um, letting them, uh, giving, giving all sorts of affects very quickly, one after the other. And they have to change their, their eyes and their face. Mm -hmm. So they have to do a kind of pantomime, very quickly sad, um, you know, furious, um, uh, jealous or whatever. And so they have uh, immediately, in, in a very intuitive way, to, to change their face. Mm -hmm. And that triggers some sort of imagination and that changes their work, way of, of, of um, playing. It's very strange, but it happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what I wanted maybe to add, uh, Puna um, wrote about musicus virtuosus, and he says uh, that musicus virtuosus is someone who just not just can play or play good, mm -hmm. but someone who also can compose music. Mm -hmm. So for him, a good musician is someone not just playing and maybe expressing their facts but someone who really can just know uh, who knows the technique, how does that work, etc. Et um, the conversation that's building here is, is really interesting to me because I think it, it raises this question about um, what we understand audiences to have expected, to have gotten from a performance. Um, and the example that you showed us on the screen of the angel, uh, the angel speech done in all white notes, complicates that question, right? Because as you say, only the performer sort of sees the score. And the assumption that the listening audience to that performance should also have access to that is not foregone, right? Like, that could be a moment that is specifically for the performer and not for the audience. Um, and so this question about the provision of access to all elements of the musical composition mm -hmm. is one that I think it, it comes back to something that we were talking about earlier in the day, right? The assumption of the historical capital O other who has perfect access to all elements of the musical composition, which we can't necessarily assume, right? Um, and if we could stay wedded to that notion of access to the object, the musical object, it forecloses a series of possibilities that we can uh, to continue in your line of creativity, right? There's lots of creative things that we can do that don't require the question of access to the object itself, right? It comes back to some of the things that you were talking about with different styles of critical theory, right? Different kinds of critical modes that push us to conceive of the text or the object of interpretation in all these different possible ways. Um, so again, I think there's the, the question of creativity here is really, really interesting, um, especially when we allow the experience of music in a historical moment mm -hmm. to proliferate in all these possible ways that aren't always about perfect access to the object or the ideal listening experience um, that allow for kind of like a, 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 a yeah, like a polymorphous proliferation of the possibilities of meaning that can emerge from the performance. Like there's interesting stuff that happens there too. Mm -hmm. But of course, access in our modern sense, that is the idea that a thousand people in a concert hall will somehow all have common access. That's right. Of course, it's, yeah. it's 
almost uh, impractically irrelevant. Yeah. So certainly comes with it. Yeah, but the Tyson is something that's been puzzling me for a while. Um, I'm coming this violinist in the recital and she played uh, Schmelzer's Victory der Christen mm -hmm. thing. It's basically the Bieber crucifixion sonata, but in A minor instead of G minor. <laughs> <laughs> the entire thing with not one note changed and yet a completely different story. And I, and even though in the 19th century context I'm, I'm always arguing for precisely this style of freedom, I still have a hard time understanding how this is allowed. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's allowed for them to take something that already has a story, and a sacred story at that, and just give it a completely new story, um, was there, was there like a, enough of a sense of what's fixed and what's flexible that we could take any piece we want and make it about a story of our choice? It's a bit like the revoicing. Of film clips on YouTube, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can harness the emotion or the dramatic power and completely repurpose it. Yeah. I think, it, if I may, I think this is because the, what the music represents in such a poetical musical uh, fusion is the soft part of the of the, of the emotive story. So the, 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 that's again uh, what the, my my reference to to Ricapi actually separates it out. So a, a real emotion is, 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 is a combined effect with a mental construct. If you take the mental construct away, you, 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 end, you end up with the, the, the pure uh, effect and that, that music next to action can portray. But I guess you can, they, they felt quite free to interchange these, uh, interchange these, write a different story. Also, with the, even in the 19th century, Vincent van Guy wrote, uh, wrote programs to the symphonies that didn't have programs. Mm. It, it seems to be a, a constant that yeah. the story can be changed. Mm. Maybe it's a, a reflection of the uh, tragic shallowness of the perceived meaning of human affairs. <laughs> <laughs> then again, if you're going to change all of the all of the figures around around the melody, then it could be that the affect isn't stable either. No. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was just wondering how we. we, we uh, again, biblical sonatas, to what extent was that performed for audiences in the first place? Because if I look at the frontispiece yeah. and I see a lady at a house, typical house, mm -hmm. yeah. house orgel, I think, I think it's perfectly imaginable that she would just read first and then play the thing and then would see that even if she knows the story, yeah. well, she's audience and performer. She can, yeah. can say, oh, that is well represented, yeah. but yeah. Some, some details are so fine grained that uh, yeah. without pronouncing this, we just, again, for me, doesn't make sense at all. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And if we would listen to these sonatas without knowing the text and without uh, all the titles and subtitles, I think it would sound very weird. Mm -hmm. You would not understand why so many contrasts, etc. And it changes. I mean, one bar is like this, another is yeah. like this. Yeah. So the closet sonata. <laughs> but, but, but actually, I I find that people instinctively want to make sense of what they hear. So sooner or later, some story will gradually. You know, it might be a <coughs> fantasy, it could be anything, but it will emerge somehow. Um, it's, it's quite extraordinary, even when you're presented with music that's based on chance operations, like music of John Cage, you can't stop yourself trying to make connections as you listen to the music. I, I think, I don't want to go on, but the, the whole point about historical performance is that it's not about practice, it's practices. And the, the same thing applies to individual acts of reception, actually. Uh, if I played, I would never, but if I played uh, Kunau to, oh, I don't know, a, a peasant in Latvia in the 18th century, they would get something from it, but it would be nothing to do with what an educated London audience might hear or an uh, audience in Berlin. And it's all about these different receptions and different performance situations. Um, I find myself more and more inclined to talk about decentering uh, in this context. And I think, uh, yeah. I thought, by the way, sorry, uh, your idea about presenting it, I think you could go all the way with presenting it to modern audiences. 
you could have religious lighting, uh, you could be introducing the audience into a, a chapel, perhaps, or something like that, mm. with images, not literal, but evocative atmospheric images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think going further in that would mm. be better than giving them text. Mm. There's a brittleness to the verbal text compared to the musical text that I thought. Mm -hmm. Tom, mm -hmm. may I go to the dangerous subject of figurato? Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 because uh, I like that some may have completely different ideas and made them like that. But I think it's important to know that as well in this library, there's a book about figurato, 550 pages by Muns, Greta Muns, where there's only one text who's saying that you should use figurato as much as possible. So we should be careful oh, yes. that there is a language and there is. Um, there is uh, something which is what people don't discuss about. And the, the guy who wants the most about is Jimmy Yang. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, but um, there's a beautiful text by a student of, of Schutz who said, if you want to hear your horrible Fibato sound, this to an alte tremolierende. So it's very uh, <coughs> sad yeah. that, uh, that it's about a lady, because for their men it can be the same thing. Yes. But, but, uh, <laughs> but, I'm not somebody who thinks you should be used to play on Fibonacci because there's no reason to do that. You should use it in a, in a clever way. Yeah. But I think sometimes, what I see in modern orchestras, that people start vibratoing, vibratoing before the note sounds. I think there's no source for that. <laughs> and and uh, if you listen to old CD, uh, LP recordings uh, uh, the, from the late 19th century, then you hear the, the curious things that there are a few people, yes. like the, the leader of the group, who is a soloist, so he's using vibrato. The rest not. Uh, of course, the uh, instruments like uh, 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 the horns are using vibrato, the uh, clarinets are using vibrato, so it's a completely different aspect. Flutes are always using vibrato. <laughs> but so it's interesting that vibrato was not a stable thing in the 19th century, particularly mm -hmm. not there. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's one thing. And the other thing that I wanted to say is about articulation marks. Uh, when we did the recount of the Bach cantat, we had all the um, sources there. And it was interesting, we had sometimes discussions between the first oboe, first trumpet, um, first cello, first violin, flute, etc. And, and me, and we were sometimes reading different things in the same articulations. Yeah. The printer does the same. He has to make out of the manuscript, which is not always clear, does it start here or there? And so I, I think there is well, there, there's a, a big knowledge. And there is not one truth, there are more truths. And I think it's good to accept that in uh, early music performance, that is not like when I was young, uh, you play Bach like Leonard, you play um, French music like the Kuykens, and you play Hanancourt, uh, had two things, Handel and Montefiore, like Hanan mm -hmm. Happily, it have changed. And uh, I always wonder if, in the 18th century, if Rameau had played Bach, mm -hmm. and Bach had played Rameau, certainly it was what we call authentic, very bad word, mm -hmm. um, but it had been completely different. If Handel had done the same with François Couperin and the other way around as well. So we have to think who we are, what, what, uh, to what, uh, language, musical language, do we know what uh, what is for us important? And I think then there is a place for everybody. Mm. One of the topics we've been researching here is the very practicality of, of composition, critical technical practice, and sort of dogma. But um, what I've often personally experienced, including in that project, is is when material comes back. Not only articulation can be different, but the very notes can be different, especially where they don't really matter. You know, somewhere in the lower yeah. wing part or something like that. Oh, yes. <laughs> this theme is coming back now. I'll fill it in. Normally I'd fill it in like this. Yeah. And it gets filled in differently. Yeah. Yeah. So the very sequence of, of practical uh, construction of this stuff is fascinating. I think. Oh, sorry. Well, we don't have time. Because we're talking a lot about the. You were talking a lot about the 19th century. Whether this idea of cultural memory, of course, we're, we're looking at um, historical uh, music, which we feel we don't have any direct connection with. Do you also feel that these 19th century editions also had no direct connection, that they were doing the same job as we are doing? 
Now, I just say because I, uh, I, I recently read a quite interesting essay by Charles Marie Vidor, who's mm -hmm. a famous French organist, about playing Bach. Of course, it was very 19th century yeah. um, in what he was saying. He didn't like the, the German organs. He was saying it should have these kind of you know, more imaginative colors. But he also, then he started talking about how Bach played the organ, what he looked like and what he did. And I was very, in, uh, it's very insulted by this kind of description. I say, yeah, come on, you know, you just you can't start playing that. But actually, he, his teacher was a student of a student of Bach. Yeah. They did have this yeah. connection. They, in some cases, yeah. they had this connection with a living tradition. Yeah, that's, um, in, in other circles, that's kind of close to funny and talk, frankly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <coughs> if I take David, uh, um, as a good example, actually. His Hohe Schule, published in the 1860s, has uh, a load of 18th century, it's almost entirely, I think, 18th century violin music. There is no suggestion that you're playing that in a historical style, yeah. and there is no suggestion that you're playing in anything other than a mid 19th century German style, um, particularly, I think, associated with light. Um, and uh, you will find this. Uh, something like that almost everywhere. Uh, people are interested in old music, but they're not interested in giving you uh, a, a sort of clean addition to play with the right instruments or anything like that. You know, you play with what you have now, yeah. in the way you play these instruments now. Yeah. You know. um, but there are other arguments. Um, for instance, uh, Joachim's first Am I right? Yeah. Joachim's first teacher was alive when Beethoven was alive. And it is very tempting, and at least one of my colleagues, whom I will not name, uh, has gone down a, made a, quite a lot of that. Um, I think it's weak, um, but uh, I, I don't normally argue about this. Um, the, how far you read back is a very difficult question to answer. And I think if you look, I've been working for a long time on the whole presence of Baroque string music in the 19th century and what people do with it. And it's very striking that it's completely unhistorical in the sense that uh, there's a French edition of uh, a load of 18th century violin music uh, published by Cartier in Paris in 1797 or something. Um, that's a brilliant text edition. It would stand up right now. It adds nothing, it takes nothing away, mm -hmm. you get Corelli's uh, figured bass, you get the violin line, and mm -hmm. that's it. And there's no advice about how to play it. Mm -hmm. uh, Bach is hardly present in that anthology, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and uh, later on, you look at Darby's edition of Corelli, uh, he can't leave a single bar or a note alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and he will recompose bits as well, because he thinks the repeats work better that way. Yeah. So you can hear a 20th century approach in 1797, yes. and you can see a completely reconstructionist approach in the middle of the 19th century. Yeah. It's, uh, it's yeah. a completely open field. Yeah. I think it's interesting that the old literature, yeah. you'll you agree, that the beautiful old text editions, really old text editions around 1800. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, just a copy from the original yeah. print, if there was a print, yeah. amazing. And the, the given care edition is still a very good edition, mm -hmm. sometimes better than the Neue Bachers oh, yeah. But then it goes wrong. <laughs> yes. But either by the players. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. That's yes. the problem. The name of the musician. Who have I heard this before? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, George and Alexander. Thank you very much. Oh. with Tom are the, the, the pillars of my of my musical uh, my musical life. A few days back. A few days, yes. I won't mention Salvaflirt in Bologna. But um, no, uh, it's been a great privilege. Not only to watch Tom in every airport lounge of the world writing in these books, making these wonderful indices, 
but more importantly still, the sharing of the excitement of these discoveries with musicians uh, has been a real privilege. And the experimenting and to see what might work, how might music be brought to life, to be brought uh, for its sense uh, to be revealed. And if this interplay, this inextricability of reflection and practice is the very foundation of, of Orpheus, uh, then no one involves its, its, its dynamic, continuous relationship more than Tom. So, welcome to Tom. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. I wanted to start with you all understand, of course, German, which book Guido was just uh, bringing in the interval, and I had not forgotten, but I think it's a beautiful uh, uh, quotation to give at the beginning. It's by Abraham as Santa Clara, 100 aus Bünike Narren, 100 very clear idiots, Narren. Uh, and there's as well about the Büchernar. <laughs> And um, um, I will send it around and you can see it. What he said in, 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 in German is, Why ich die Bücher so vermehr, I bought so many books, dass ich nichts als den Staub abkehre, too much work to get all the, the Staub away, um, bin ich aus den gelehrten Orden, aus den in, intelligenten people, um, um, gar zu einem Narr geworden. Ich bin I am becoming a nar, an idiot. Uh, when niemand der mich für erkennt, tut mich doch meine Frau so nennen. So <laughs> my my wife understood because she saw that there. This, this is the beautiful print by Weigel. Um, if you want a book, I mean it's it's a book, but it's not an original here because I have some of the engraving, but not the original book because it's quite difficult to find and expensive but beautiful facsimile I have to say I was always fascinated by old books my first old book I bought was when I was 13 years old at that point I was already organized in a little chapel uh, not earning money but earning once a year a book where I could um, uh, select myself, and this was mostly um, about organ making. Uh, it should be about music, and so I have those books still, they are here. Um, and uh, then, when I was 13 years old, in Zwolle, my birth town, where the beautiful Schnitko organ is, just in restoration now, and uh, will be fantastic work, um, I found just in a little antique shop uh, my first old book. It was Having Ga, uh, a Dutch translation of Ken, a book about Passo Continuo playing. How could it be different? But uh, uh, at that point, you bought such a book for 10 guilders, so 5 euro. Um, and, uh, but it was already difficult to find them. Of course, the most more expensive books were not to me at that point, but the prices were at that point really possible. And, uh, Sometime I passed shops, I started to talk with people because I was in love with books and I thought that antiquarian shops often had not so many people who were buying books, so they had time and they knew me, so in Zwolle, then later came in other towns and I started to buy a little better. A little more money I collected sometime for a book. So I said, Can I pay him five times? Um, it was, I remember in Zola there was next to a snack bar, um, and a little shop uh, not bigger than this, and the books were like that. If you took one book, everything was falling on the floor. <laughs> and I normally went with a friend on the gymnasium uh, there because he liked croquetten. Very Dutch uh, to eat, and uh, and then slowly he came with me as well to look for books. He later became a poet, and uh, he was interested in poetry at that point already. So we started both to select books there for a book from the 19th century. You paid one guilder, two guilders, um, and but suddenly he had interesting things, and then he knew as well that it should be a bit more money. 
but slowly I started to look for more interesting things. And uh, I found them. Sometimes it was easy at that time to find a release score. Uh, not too easy on this moment. You still can find them, but prices are different. Uh, a manuscript of maybe an unknown uh, uh, copyist of music from the 18th century, you could find it at that point. Uh, early treatises, uh, particularly when it, it, when it was in Holland and it was not in Dutch, you could easily find it. In Dutch it was more expensive, but uh, if it was French particularly, you could find. So some of those are from that time. When I was 14, I became church organist, um, not in my birth room, but in Almelo, close by. Uh, so there was a new market to pass for, and as well I was paid. I was not paid by a book, but with money, real money. So uh, I could use that, and uh, I did. When I went to Amsterdam to study harpsichord and, and organ and so on musicology, uh, of course there was a merabois, there were many, many shops, and you started to learn already quite quick where you should go. That's what the shops with were seeing a little boy coming up who were friendly with the price. Um, um, as well, for me it was not too important if the book had the most beautiful cover or super libros or something like that. It was a book I wanted to read. And I didn't buy only, as you can see here as well, books about music. I bought as well something when something was interesting and not too expensive. And that all went up and up during the time. The Waterloo-Plein in Amsterdam didn't give too many books, I have to say, but you could find their tiles, which was one other collection of mine. You could find, in another shop next to Nieuwe Kerk, you could find engravings, another part of my collection, and sometimes you could find suddenly uh, equilibrises, which is another part of my book. I could go on, but those are the most important ones. Um, when I got, a little later, the 3M prize, and uh, Franz de Ruyter knows about that. Uh, he was in the jury for that. I suddenly got 100,000 guilders, and I had to spend it to something which has to do with my occupation. So I was the first to spend the money, quick, everything. And I started to come in contact with international antiquarian shops, London particularly, but as well in Paris. I, I went sometime with my friend Jordi Saval, he was a collector as well, uh, to a shop at the Seine, uh, which is still there with a red uh, facade. And then you could get the key from the magazine. And you could go there, and, uh, and then we both collected staples of books. And then it came to the prices. So we, we could have gone with the, with the keys and the books away, but you didn't do that. And uh, then we came with the stables, and then they made prices, and then we said, is that more for you? That's more for me? So we divided the things, and uh, I still have a very interesting and nice, sweet memory of that. I started to, co to collect for books catalogues of auctions, particularly auctions where I expected that there were musical books, or there were engravings, uh, particularly the, the copies where there were prices, because I felt interesting to see how little books cost. If I see in uh, just when uh, the French Revolution comes and all the choir books from the abbeys are on the market, how little they were costing, they were really very uh, small prices. And then you see people who buy, bought on the same moment 80 copies. <laughs> and you see still in Holland, the, the, you see the book, but there are many, but there are other as well many private people who, uh, who did the same uh, uh, buying of uh, those. They were very easy to get and so of course became a price. And now if you see them at all, maybe in Portugal you could have a good chance. I have once a chance, but for the rest, even in Spain, Italy, that expensive. But I started to look for certain books because I, I felt if you perform music from the past, uh, you should know, you should read about it. And uh, of course I know that the one who has read more than anybody else is not the best performer. There should be something more. But anyhow, to know what are your borderlines is extremely important. And uh, uh, yeah, if you go only for 17th, 18th century, um, 
there's really a lot to read, and there's still a lot that I didn't read. Uh, but as well, sometimes you, you come across books from the 16th century which are extremely interesting. And, uh, and so I think all this book here is a manuscript from 1430, but it has nothing to do with my interest, but it's a, um, a Bible um, exegese. It's but a beautiful book, and uh, I liked it. Um, there were, around the World War, Second World War, when I was not born yet, um, there were collectors, and some of them were collecting books just because they loved them, but there were books, people who collected books as well, because they were easy to get, because if there were Jewish people uh, who went, who were deported, or they could, like in France, got like on Doska and on a guerre, got 48 hours to get away and take what they could take, then they were there. And uh, when you think that our MGG, the music in the sheet of Gagin, my famous German um, uh, encyclopedia for music, was prepared before the Second World War by Blumen, then Blumen was willing to take all the Jewish names out, and after the Second World War, the names came back, and Blumen did still the same job. And it took up to Christoph Wolf to say Jacques Cluse. I, I say, you are wrong, what you did. And I think for many collectors, sad to say, it was the same. They got too easy books. They were standing there when the people were bought away, and they collected for themselves, and a little bit for the German state. And it's not important to give names, but, um, but as well, in France it happened the same, and, uh, and famous pianist was there. Uh, you could go. So some of those options uh, were in the time that I was collecting. And so I bought some of their books, some of them with beautiful uh, exhibits inside. And then when you see what was in the library, you couldn't imagine that you were ever to buy it now. Uh, there was an American library who um, uh, went to an auction the second part of an auction in Paris, and they had 11 million to spend, and they bought a lot from the auction, but there was still a lot left. If you think for Kunau, there were two books of the Kavir uh, Ugo Kunau, which the Bach Archive in Leipzig bought for enormous prices, because this university brought the prices so up, and it was done by American agents, an antiquarian shop, who, when the price was more, he got more money. So it was a bad thing. So Kunal went 12,000 euro. So that is, I mean, it's rare, but it's a very rare, rare price. But as well, I sometimes came across, uh, when I was collecting, uh, little bookshops who had no, not many early books. But for instance, here, a book where it's a Handel uh, uh, cantata, which is unknown. It's from the time that Handel was in, in Rome, so it's before 1710. Uh, we don't know who wrote it. Um, we know only that it's paper from Rome, and musicologists who know a lot about Handel uh, uh, took the book with them to London to discuss, and they only said, yeah, we know this guy who wrote it, uh, because in the Fitzwilliam Museum there are as well two motets by Handel. But when I bought it, I didn't buy it, because I thought, now I have a unique piece. It was a cantata I knew. In the beginning it was the same, the first aria was a known aria. But then, and I didn't see it, and I had less books about Handel than about Bach, um, I did later see by John Roberts, a good friend of mine who is a librarian in uh, San Francisco, who I asked, can you have a look? Because there's a name in the book, At um, Uzum Serafina Agostini. And I was curious to know, because apparently that was, and I thought, a man. There were all sopran cantatas, or cantatas for uh, castrato. And I thought, he as a Handel scholar would know. And then it was him who uh, said, oh, just send a few photocopies. And I think Elina got within an, uh, a minute the answer, you have a unique piece. And I didn't know, because curious, Handel composed the same text twice. And maybe he lost the first version and did it again. In my version, there is, of course, uh, a, a lady uh, who was in love with a man. Um, um, everything went wrong. In my uh, version, there is something like, 
away with him, this horrible guy. In the known version, which is later than my copy, yes, we, we had such good positive things as well. We didn't know how the, how the uh, relations is. is. Uh, it's published so you can find it in the, uh, the Neue Handel edition. And uh, so, by actually it was 45 years there without knowing that it was so unique. And I think that's often happening with, uh, with colleagues, uh, collectors. It's not to, to help myself out, but I know more collectors who like to have the book. You want to have it. And you know it's there, so you can use it. And that's, of course, now when the collection is here, you have to do more work uh, to get it. But I'm very proud that I still can see everything here, I can work here, and uh, that in this um, author's library um, that the Copeland Collection is having such a good home that Peter, uh, Bruno, and all the others, including Eline, who was in my place taking care for the library and uh, uh, said when we both were with tears in the eyes when the collection went away, uh, said, no, I'm a, a librarian from no library anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there are still some, line, some books at uh, home, I don't know how many, but quite some. There are quite some old books already bought again. <laughs> I was here and Bruno was well, and Elina was there as well, but Elina did it actually. Uh, there was in London for sale the François Couperin Lady to Chile Clavecin. And we got it and we were all having fun. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so it will go on and, and uh, later, of course, uh, the books will arrive here because the Copa collection is incomplete here. But I'm very proud to see it and, and um, I'm incredibly happy that Franz and Peter were able to find a sponsor to buy the collection because it was not a present, uh, it's too valuable for that. And, uh, and it's nice to see how much now five people are working in this collection, trying to get the indexes uh, on computer, getting the, uh, many of the manuscripts, uh, uh, I think all the manuscripts are now, in, uh, are now digital, dig digitized, I, or something like that. I, I don't know anything about computer. Um, but it's maybe worth to say one word about the indexes. I'm a lazy person, and nobody believes that, but I'm lazy if I can. So I don't want to read a book for a second time. And I started when I became a student in the University in Amsterdam, and had a professor who was not at all interested in rock music, and particularly not in historical instruments. And uh, um, I started reading books with, with a pen, making notes of the most important things. And when I see uh, the images that I made, very long ago, I see they are much more incomplete than the ones I do now. So some of them I, I did again, some I will at some point do again. Uh, but the good thing of such an index is that if you want to read only one time, uh, you have information, if everything is in a computer, about, let's say, Cantata, Bach Cantata 86. If you want to know about what is here, you look BW, BW 86, and you see why you're fighting. In the book, in the index, you will see that there may be a difference between what's important, what's not important at all. Um, and there are books where I wrote, if the name Bach is there, I wrote it down. But if there's interesting about Bach, um, I, I start the moment to say Bach general, uh, then Bach cantat, Bach hardcore music. Uh, so I made more and more specific uh, differences in in the collection, because I saw myself as well, if I took a book and thought, hmm, I didn't read that. Why didn't you know? I know there is something about Cantata at six of Bach. Why can I find, I have to go to all the Bachs to find it. And so I tried to make it even more, uh, more clear that you can, with a quick look for those people, and I think you are all, uh, who can work with computers, that you can find it. Um, to collect books is, as my wife say, an illness. <laughs> it's not dangerous, because none of my family members uh, start to collect books. But I know one family in Edom, where man and woman, a man and husband are both collecting different things. And the poor house is... <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be 
carefully doing it, but they had the fun to speak with people who know more about the subject, about the book that you buy, than you know yourself. It's a great privilege. And your knowledge becomes wider and wider, and, uh, and there's still uh, quite a list every time when I read a book, um, Elena gets some of those fantastic, by the way, to buy in France, Leclerc. This is one of those <laughs> things you will get. So, right, Elena, can you please try to find this? And there's sometimes more than things, more than this. sometimes it's only possible to photocopy, sometimes it's a, a dissertation uh, in a library where sometimes people are very friendly to help, sometimes it's, it's very difficult to get it, or you have to copy it yourself somewhere. It's for all books the same. And often I get a book, I cannot find it. It's only in the start you take in Leipzig, in, the, in Berlin. And uh, uh, so many of the old books, how many copies were there? Um, I would say um, for a normal book in the 18th century, 200 copies is quite a good number. 250 maybe. If it was a book to sing in the church, it could have been our Bible, 1500. And with Bach, you see, uh, Bach did printing on command, as we call it now, uh, but he had somebody to do it. Uh, maybe he had only 30 copies. Um, maybe the first time, 60 copies, and then a few more. And it's interesting to see that some of the books, the editions of Bach, were so cared for by later collectors that uh, uh, I think from the uh, Goldberg edition, I had 19 copies. Beautiful edition, I have to say. Um, from the um, from the Kunze uh, something like that as well. Very good editions. Um, from the Kavibu Eins, one the, the, where the partitas for half uh, I think there are eleven only. But interesting there is that Bach wrote in some of the copies extra information. And I think if the half score plays on us, it's interesting to know that. Uh, Bach did it only in, in Partita 2 and 3. In Partita, Partita 2, in the pom 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 the second half of the pom there's the end pom 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 it was discovered, not by me, but by Christoph Wolf in the 80s. And when I was shortly ago in Washington, where it is, um, I told the custodian from the music library, do you know you have a, a printed uh, Bach edition with uh, a notation by Bach himself? I said, no, no, we don't have that. I said, just look. And so she got the books out of the shelves, and she was amazed. Not in the same, the only library that you don't know that. I think that's, that's a real scandal. Um, um, and when you think for the same Bach and the number three, the Partita, uh, um, when you see editions and you have to make an new text edition about that, you get big problems because we have a version uh, where the first movement of the is three bars shorter than the later one. Well, what is your um, uh, text edition when you do that? Those two books have more than 300 extra ornaments written by Bach himself. Of course, you don't find them in any edition. Um, what do we do? Is it like with me? Uh, I like to play ornaments because for me ornaments are dynamic. Uh, if you can play easy ornaments, then it's easy to the extra trill, the extra appoggiatura, etc. If you have troubles to play them, you're happy with all the trills to be played, that you play them, and you don't add them. So, what are you going to do with the Nordic edition? The Neue Bach edition uh, had big fights after the publication of the Partitas, and the, the fight is still there, and I think they made the wrong decision by not publishing it. Organ Trio Sonatas, a beautiful, interesting manuscript in Vienna, written by Oli, apparently, so the last Bach student. So it was not allowed to be used by the Neue Bach edition. So what are Urtex editions worth? So let's go, get the word away, but let's go for more into the spirit of the Urtex edition. 
maybe published when there are two versions, which from some music it's there, um, published two versions. I think it was well done in the books who the organ works. Um, you can make up your own, your own um, conclusion what should be the best one. And if then there's a critical comment, which with the old works of Buxtude is bigger than the old works itself, then read it. Because the musicologist did a lot of work and maybe made the wrong decision, but you should check him. Don't trust a uh, musicologist. Be happy that they are there. <laughs> <laughs> Be happy that they are there and know that they do excellent work. But excellent can sometimes be even better because how many musicologists do play? If you ask me uh, to uh, make an edition, what they did, about, about the old works of Buxuda, I said no, because I think it's impossible to make. To do an, edit, an, an a recording is possible, because in a recording doesn't last for 50 years. And so in an edition that you make, you should have an edition where you're 100% certain about now, a few sources of Buxuda are from his lifetime, but most of them are later, and are the latest ones are 1840. What is truth? And you have to lose something uh, when you make an edition. So I think because of that, you should know what your borderlines are. You should read about it in modern edition. You should, as you can, see the originals, read the tablet you and think not, I cannot do it. We're supposed to read from a score, like you heard this afternoon. Uh, then it's easy to learn to read tablet you. Uh, I once wanted to play from it, and I didn't do it because I, I thought, okay, I organized a master class and I asked people to play from and nobody, no student was there. So uh, there was no reason for me to, to do it. But to read it, you will see as well that some of the notes are much too long in our editions. Because the um, territory editions not always give the length of a note. So there's a lot for us to know, and I think we should know when we are players, when we are musicologists, we should try to stay in contact with players, but we as players should stay in contact with the musicologists. I, I go to Leipzig in tomorrow, that's why I er leave earlier tomorrow than I should, but I cannot do it because I have to be there tomorrow evening already. Um, I have meetings with, with everybody who is important in the musicology of Bach. They never like to to eat together, they like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's, it's nice to talk with them, it's nice to, um, to uh, with a good glass of wine to discuss about their problems. They're young, promising musicologists in the Bach Institute and maybe you know I'm the president of the Bach Institute. So when I'm there I always ask the uh, Peter Wolny, the director, and uh, some interesting new people, some I know because of the Bach book where you read it, but you want to, to know what they are doing. And, uh, and so it's interesting that even they are not always uh, knowing everything. Because here in the, the library, there's a manuscript from uh, a suite for, Lauten, uh, for lute transposed for harpsichord by the same Oli, I think it's the same Oli. And uh, the lady making the, the new. Uh, the Bachwerkenverzeichnis, which is coming out next Monday, uh, didn't know that, so she could just add it. And so it's good, we, we stay in contact with each other, nobody will know everything, but maybe when we have good contact, we will all know. And I hope that my library will help for that, used here, and with so much love, cared for. Photos from how it looked like. If you want to, it's normally behind the board, the, the gate here. If you want to, did you see it? No, it's like it's, it's the Jonathan. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you so much. We have to ask questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. After all that methodological advice, <laughs> uh, very useful to us all, <laughs> very practical. How do you deal with so much information yourself? 
That's oh, you forget it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make, make, make good notes. Um, and as well, I have the luxury that Elin is still there. Um, not only to take care for, for the library, but as well, if I write an article, she's doing a lot of work for me. I, I, I write by hand, not by computer. Um, and uh, we, together, I'm trying to find all the sources that we need. And sometimes Elin is much more lucky than me. Sometimes, by, by thinking memory, uh, things come up. And uh, so that's great, actually. I'm glad, glad for that. I have, a, I have a remark, just a testimony of a memory of someone who does not have a computer. I think <laughs> it's exemplary what computers do to memory. It's not, yeah. not good. <laughs> but uh, one day Tom uh, sent me a message uh, asking me, uh, I, I now have a catalogue of the Rijksmuseum paintings. I think at some point I noted there that it could be Johan Adam Reinken's portrait there. Mm. Uh, can you f look it up? And I went to look at we had three books of, of Rijks Museum. And I went there, and indeed in the index, there's the system, a double question mark. And I went to the page, and sure enough, there was a little page saying, Johan Adam Reich, and in question mark. So <laughs> now the, the point of it, uh, we've talked about the art of memory, and, and Umberto Eco. Umberto Eco once said, could there be next to an Ars Memoriae and us oblivionalis. We <laughs> <laughs> <You> forget it. <laughs> well, on that point, I'd like to thank Tom again. <laughs> and let's not forget that there's dinner at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Can, you can, people who want, I believe. I'm happy to give some uh, information and split up maybe um, see if it's also here. She knows the story. Know the story. It's a uh, Did you get the, the another thing? Yes. Uh, yeah. Because I stole it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>